morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Eddie Austin here with my partner, Shane Carter, Hampshire Capital. Today, we're going to talk about different ways to partner. We have this question a lot. We're in this real estate meetups and things like that. And Brady asked the question, how do I get into real estate? How do I get into multifamily? And what are the different ways to partner? Today, Shane and I are going to talk about a few things about the new ways to partner. And they're not new. It's just something that nobody really talks about. So let's get started. All right. So, you know, Shane, we get these questions all the time, man. And, you know, there's there's so many ways to do things with LLC and stuff like that. But I say we start from like ground level. I'm going to talk about tenant and common here a little bit. And feel free to jump in and add something I'm not saying. And then take it away on syndication. And then we'll talk in about funds, you know, on the high level. You know, somebody that has a little more education they could do a, a real estate fund and they could also partner with people. Absolutely. So for a tenant in common, this is the most elementary way I know that people can partner. Say you found a piece of property, say it's a, a 15 unit or a 30 unit multifamily deal, and you're going to need a few things to close that property. So you found the property. So your place in this partnership is you found the property. And you got to do some work to put this all together. Well, you're probably going to need a high net worth person. So that deal is maybe $10 million to buy it. So you're going to need somebody that has a financial statement and probably liquidity to close something like that with the bank. So you're going to need that guy. And then you probably also need an asset manager. I mean, you found this piece of property. Maybe it's something your brother had or maybe your mom or maybe our good friend had it. and They're just looking to get out of the real estate business. So you found the property, now you've identified a sponsor, and now you need somebody that can operate the deal. So you got three people, essentially, that's in this opportunity. You're going to form an LLC called a tenant in common. A tenant in common is basically an LLC. It doesn't have any partnership structures in, outside of it, only the three people. So Shane, the high net worth individual, he's signing on a loan. I found the property and Jack's our asset manager. So all three of these people will be inside this made up LLC and you can call it, you know, opportunity one and you're gonna take that to the bank and you're gonna explain it to the bank, here's our operating agreement and, you know, Shane is our loan signer. He's also gonna oversee the property. Um, I'm gonna take care of the daily operations of the property. I'm gonna do the books, the accounting, stuff like that. I'm gonna take care of the insurance. Um, just going to be the guy that's, you know, inside of this. And then Jack is actually the, the property manager. He's going to actually manage this asset beside an asset manager, not to get into the weeds on that. So that's your tenant and common model. It's not really a scalable model and it can only be done on one, one single deal. And that's just it. Is there anything you would add to that, Shane? Uh, no, I look, I think you covered that perfectly. That's, uh, that's exactly right. And then, you know, frankly, the syndication model is not that different, really, right? I mean, no, really, it, the, the only difference is you have the same type of opportunity on the on the GP side of things, the general partnership side, but you're able to sell securities on the LP side of things. That's exactly so, right. Yeah. And so that's the that's the main difference there between the that those two models is, as you as you've pointed out, Eddie, the difference between the, the general partnership side and the limited partnership side. Uh, important thing to note, of course, on that is the limited partners are called limited partners because they have a limit of liability, right? Whereas the general partners, uh, we are generally the ones who are taking, taking more of the risk, um, signing on the loan, uh, signing the guarantees, completion guarantees for construction, you know, if there were something to go wrong at the asset, we would carry liability um, potentially forward from from just that one asset. Uh, whereas an investor in a limited liability component would really limit their liability to that one investment they made in that one asset. So that's a, maybe a quick aside, but the you know, as far as the syndication goes, the the structure is really similar, right? There's somebody who brings the deal and potentially gets GP, well, what does get GP interest for that? There's somebody who is a KP sponsor, uh, signs on the mortgage, uh, offers their net worth and liquidity for uh, qualifying for the bank debt, signing on the bank debt. 
Um, and then there is the raising of the capital or the syndication of the of the funds and bringing in all of the LP investors into the deal. That generally speaking has a and you know investor relations and reporting, et cetera. That generally has a, a, a general partnership uh, percentage allocated to it as well for for the individuals that are doing that. Uh, and then there's asset management, construction management, et cetera. The, the GP component has somebody who's, who's bringing the deal, somebody who's KP sponsoring the deal, uh, folks who are raising the capital and they have GP uh, responsibilities. And then you have sort of asset management and construction management. Those are all separate functions as well that would potentially have uh, GP percentages allocated to it. So it's, it's similar to a tenant in common that way, just potentially a bigger team of folks if you're taking right. down 20, 40, 50, 80 million dollar assets. So, you know, the, the, the term, this term always gets thrown around in the space, joint venture. Everybody's talking about joint venture. And every time they bring it up, I can't help but think that's a syndication. Everybody says, oh, what's it? Do you ever do JV deals? It's, it's the, basically the same thing. It's just a different term. It's either syndication or it's a joint venture, but essentially it's the same exact model. Yeah, well, slightly different, maybe potential, potentially different, which is that... Uh, well, depending on, I guess, who you are. If you're a bank, that's a different story. Yeah, well, or, you know, a joint venture could be, let's say you just need, you know, $2 million for an acquisition. A syndication would be, hey, I'm going to go out and I'm going to file an SEC dot form D and we're going to do a, a, a 506 B or C and I'm going to raise, you know, I'm going to get 40 folks to come together with $50,000 each. And we're going to come up with that $2 million. And that's a syndication as opposed to a JV, which is that, you know, Eddie Austin happens to have $2 million. And through an operating agreement, we complete a joint venture that doesn't necessarily have a syndication component because Eddie's just bringing the $2 million. Right. So we could honestly say that the joint venture is the new way to call it a tenant in common. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about, let's outline our investors here a little bit because there's a, another thing that we've always talked about in these real estate conferences and stuff is investors. You know, we always call them limited partners and we were talking about acronyms and stuff like that. And these different things, how to speak to the everyday person. And I don't think many people realize the different ways that you can be an investor. If you are, and you know, if you have a 506B opportunity and somebody has an IRA and they're a non-accredited person or self-directed, you know, or a 401k that they have a, a, a majority of control of where they, how much money can be allocated to different opportunities, that could be put in an IRA. So the everyday person, you know, whether they're employed, self-employed, either way, they can be an investor in real estate options. And they could be an investor where they're not accredited or accredited. Now, only our opportunities are only accredited investors at this time. Right. But we have talked about doing a Reg A plus in the future. Right. But, you know, for the investor in an LP, you know, you're a limited partner, but that limited partner could be anyone with a 401k that has a control component, component that they could invest in something else besides stock funds and mutual funds. Yeah, an investor, anyone that wants to understand more about if you can invest or you cannot invest, we are happy to advise. Reach out to all, reach out to us on any one of our platforms, and we're happy to assist any way that we can. Because an investor can be a 401k that you have a component where you can invest a certain amount of funds and other options outside stock bonds and mutual funds. You can also invest from your IRA high net worth, just money sitting in the bank, just pulled 50 million out of Silicon Valley and wanted to go back in the market, we have options, we have opportunities. So reach out. Uh, and as we continue to build our business, we will have options like a Reg A Plus where we can have 35 non-accredited and unlimited amount of accredited investors. Absolutely. So one of the most ways, now this is the one I get excited about, this is the fun model. So we get all the time, we have questions on people that have like a family office, you know, they got two or three friends or they've got 20 friends that they each have a few hundred thousand dollars. And they're like, how can I partner with you guys? I have, I have people with money. Well, I feel like the best way to do that 
is to start a fund and mm -hmm. actually you call a fund of funds. So you would start a fund. It's a real estate option. You have to fully disclose this in your PPM on what you plan to do with it and how you plan to, to allocate money to different options. You would have to build a pitch deck to your uh, friends and family about who your sponsors are. So you would have a Hampshire Capital in there as your pitch deck and that we've identified X property and that we're going to invest in there and we're looking for $5 million for that. So if you had a fund that was structured as a fund of funds, you could bring us that equity and even possibly, depending on how much you bring us, you could get a GP share in our deal as well. You're going to get an LP spot for sure because you're bringing that in. But you could also have a GP share of one of our opportunities as well. Sure. And the fund of funds is so cool. Yes, it is. That That is the... That's the next level of, of magnification of, of, uh, of capital and how it works. And, and really, like, like to your point, there are a lot of folks out there that, you know, can essentially aggregate together, you know, a million dollars from 10 folks that have 100,000 or so on and so forth. And they can leverage that to invest in opportunities with us or invest in our fund and opportunities um, and, and leverage that opportunity uh, more so than they could if they just invested their own 100,000 separately. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's a real powerful model. Oh, I love it. I, you know, I'm, you know me. I'm the fun guy. I like anything to do with funds. Absolutely. And uh, you know, another thing as we explore and as we can become more and more educated in the space, one of Shane and I's biggest topics right now, and one of the things that we're really working hard on, is more education on 1031 exchanges into some type of an investment model. Uh, at the at to the current date, we might not have it figured out, but I can assure you, we are working on that as best we can to figure out new ways to bring in 1031 money into opportunities. Because I know myself, and I know you for sure, have had tremendous amounts of people call us that were running out of time on 1031s, and they just wanted a place to put it. That's right. That's right. Well, Eddie, we, we may just have to start our own DST. That, that, might, just have to do. that might be well, the easiest way. Office, you know, the, the dream would be that from a thousand dollar investment all the way up to a hundred million dollar investment and 1031 accredited, not accredited. I want the whole spectrum. Yeah. If I want to help each and every, I want to help each person and help them with each opportunity they're trying to solve. You yeah, know, because. To, to your point, it's, it's really tough. It really becomes a timing issue, right? Where we have a deal, we have a closing, it's, it's on a timeline, and that doesn't necessarily match often or, you know, with everyone else's closing and timeline and identification period um, and investment timeline for their 1031 and being able to come in in a multiple tick structure format with us on an asset. So really a DST is a, is a great way to probably solve that in a, in a big picture way. We, uh, very possible. Uh, we we should put that into our uh, our next our next edition of uh, of fund management as well. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Well, is there anything you want to add? I think we covered about everything on ways to partner. Yeah. No, I think that's it. I, I think I think that maybe the overarching message is you know are, are we open to partnering with people? Uh, are we open to JVs? Are we open to to tick structures and syndication uh, structures with folks? And the answer is yes, not only yes, but but we've done it uh, for years and years now. We have a lot of experience with it. We understand how to do it. And if this is new or, or it seems uh, strange or challenging or difficult to you, you know, we're happy to talk it through with you and help you out. Well, that, and you know, that's, I'm glad to hear that we do something like that because we hear it so much in the general market. But the biggest thing, the one I'm most excited about is the systems that we can bring that would help an operator operate and especially a newer operator. Yeah. You know, we've been through our growing pains on how we operate properties and today we've learned from that and we can, we've had formulated systems that we're actually proving in the market as we speak every day that we can actually help you out with. So not only can you bring us an opportunity that we could partner on, but we can also be your partner that brings you the systems that help you win. That's right. That's right. I'll, I'll, I'll just tease a, a few of those items, right? Like, do you have a extremely detailed addendum to your PSA 
that discusses exactly what items need to be delivered uh, from the seller to you as the buyer uh, in your due diligence time period or prior to the start of your due diligence time period? Is that a very detailed addendum that is, you know, 40, 50 items long that details out exactly what you need? Do you have a very detailed system and process on how you manage due diligence and, and what that process is? Um, then when do you have a, a very highly detailed closing process and checklist, um, do you have a week one checklist of, of property takeover? What happens week one? What happens in week two? What is that zero to 30 day property takeover checklist timeline system and process? We have that. And it's extremely important to those critical times. We actually have a 30, 60, 90 day uh, at property takeover. Uh, and then, of course, our ongoing KPIs as well. Um, and if you're not doing that, then uh, I think you're missing the boat on best in, pre best in class uh, management techniques. Yeah. And even the, the one that does give the really big teaser, the five to six day unit turnaround renovation plan. Oh, uh, yes. Free right now. You Absolutely. Know, that's, that's, a, that's an $8,500 a unit turn completed in five to six days. If you could learn that. Yeah, that's that's a big one because it's all about days to revenue, right? How long does oh, it yeah, take to yeah. get it from offline to online and released? That's critical. Well, I mean, if you just bought it, let's, let's be honest here. When you have a brand new baby for the first time and you leave the hospital, you don't get a manual. No, you don't. And, uh, and, <laughs> and you get home and you're like, what do I do? You know? yeah. So when you close your first 300 unit deal, and it's the same thing. And it starts to cry a little bit. You're like, what do I do? Right. You know, and what am I supposed to do now? So you just went through the super stressful period of the closing. Now that you got it closed. Now, now the closed. real work begins. Yeah. Right. Now, yeah. now, and then half those units need renovated. And days to revenue is not something you thought about. Right. Um, and all you're doing is you're going in there. You got a brand new contractor. You're starting to trust. They go in and they do the best they can, but they're you're now you're 30, 45 days and you haven't got your first renovation done. It's a problem. It's a problem. Yeah. Yep. All right, man. Great episode as always. Uh, I, yes. I think that was, I think that was a great one. Hopefully people get a lot of value out of this one. Yes, absolutely. Please reach out to us if you'd like some help. We'll see you on the next one.